Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible study in the book of Genesis. Tonight is study number 43 of Genesis chapter 19. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before Jehovah. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. Okay, just uh, one more point. Um, concerning Lot's wife, that she became a pillar of salt. And uh, when we search the Bible for the word salt, and, and that's how we learn what a word means, we find that salt has everything to do with sacrifice. In Leviticus 2, verse 13, it says, In every oblation of thy meat offering, shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering with all thine offerings. Thou shalt offer salt. All sacrificial offerings were to include salt. And and, and, and so, uh, of course, that uh, links, it joins together, sacrifice and salt. And we, we uh, then have to just ask the question, well, what was a sacrifice? And what would Lot's wife have to do with a sacrifice? And the answer to the question, what were the sacrifices that we read about in the Bible uh, all over the place, they were God's commandments to his people uh, uh, regarding sacrifices that were to be offered. And in every sacrifice, no matter the type, in every sacrifice, it was an illustration that Sin is a transgression of God's law that uh, arouses the anger of God himself. And, and because his law has been transgressed and man has offended eternal God, there must be satisfaction performed. That is, the law demands that justice be accomplished and the wages of sin is death. That is, what satisfies the law's demand for justice is death. And that's why uh, so many sacrifices uh, had to do with the death of an animal. The animals were slain, their blood was shed, the animal carcass was burnt, pointing to appeasement of an angry God, pointing to that which atones for sin. And, and sacrifices, uh, of course, pointed to the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, is, who was the great sacrifice for the sins of his elect people. Christ died not for the whole world, not for every human being, no, that's, that's what is falsely taught by many in the churches today. But Christ died specifically for a limited number that the Bible identifies as those chosen before the foundation of the world. They are known as God's elect. They are a remnant out of the whole. They are the few out of the many of mankind. And, and the Bible uh, does speak of a number of 200 million, which perhaps does represent the totality of God's elect. And that would be a remnant, wouldn't it, if we look at the whole history 
of the world. There were many, many billions of people that lived upon the earth at one time or another. Even today, we have uh, seven and a half billion or more, and, and and a very tiny remnant are truly saved. Christ died for the remnant. He died for those that are few. What about the rest? What about the rest? They also have transgressed the law of God. The, uh, the Word of God, the Bible is clear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the Word of God is clear. The wages of sin for all is death. For the few, the elect, Christ pays that penalty. He dies on their behalf and satisfies the law. And, and, and now the law looks at the whole company of the elect and has nothing against them. It sees no offense. It, it finds no fault. They are washed from their sins. They're cleansed from all iniquity. They uh, uh, have <clears throat> no uh, angry God uh, waiting to destroy them any longer. No, God is pleased with them because the the uh, um, the the um, sin, the, um, the the terrible thing that stood between them and God has been taken care of. It has been settled by the Lord Jesus Christ, atoning work performed at the foundation of the world and applied some point in history to each one through the Word of God as the vehicle or the applicator that applied the blood to the soul. Well, you see, again, this is the problem for the unsaved individual that his sins have not been removed and they're upon him. And Judgment Day, the, this time of final judgment, is, is really um, a, a one big sacrifice that God himself is offering, uh, or, or God is offering the wicked of the world, he's offering up all the unsaved people of the earth as a burnt offering. He, he will offer them up the, their, their punishment, the wrath of God that's upon them in order to satisfy the law's demand. And, and the law's demand will be satisfied with their total destruction, with their death. God's law will be appeased. They, each and every unsaved person in the world, will offer up themselves as an atonement for their sin. God is the one, of course, making sure they offer up themselves. And their sacrifice of, their, of themselves, their atonement on behalf of their own sin, will be accepted by God. And then the law will, uh, will uh, again, have nothing more to say against them. But, of course, the enormous, insurmountable problem that each and every unsaved individual has is that once they have been offered up and destroyed and, and turned into a burnt offering, they have no power or ability to come back from that point, to rise from the dead as Christ had power, because he was eternal God, to rise and in his resurrection to justify all those that he died for. And, and all of them, the elect, will likewise rise from the dead on the last day. But this will not happen for the natural-minded people, for those that, that are in their sins, they will make payment, final payment for sin, and then uh, they, they uh, will, will not return from that. They'll not live again. They'll not go on into eternity future. Their life comes to an end when God is finished with this world. 
And, and so uh, Lot's wife is turned into a pillar of salt in a historical parable that is it happened in actual time in history, but it's representing the day of judgment at the end of the world when mankind will uh, be judged and become this sacrifice before God. And, and so every sacrifice is, offer, is offered with salt. And, and therefore Lot's wife, uh, it, here, she's like the salt uh, that, that comes along with the sacrifice. And, and it's pointing to the, the final sacrifice of mankind. Now, uh, we, we could go to many places which show that, that it is God's intention to receive the destruction of the wicked at the time of the end as a sacrifice, but maybe Isaiah uh, 34 is a good, good place that shows it, where uh, it, it says in verse 2, For the indignation of Jehovah is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter. And then it says in verse 5, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of Jehovah is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For Jehovah has a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness, for it is the day of Jehovah's vengeance, and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion, and the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day, the smoke thereof shall go up forever, from generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Now, this is language of the final judgment of the world. And notice how God is speaking of uh, lambs and goats and the sacrifice of Basra. And, 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 it, it, and then we, we read of fire and brimstone and the smoke ascending, just as we're finding in Genesis 19. You see, the final judgment is likened to an ultimate sacrifice of the offender. They did not have Christ as their sacrifice. He did not die for their sin. They must be their own sacrifice and die for their own sins. And that's where the salt comes in. For every sacrifice is to be salted with salt. Uh, it, it says in Deuteronomy 29, in Deuteronomy 29, we read this verse before, in verse 23, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning, that is not sown nor beareth nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, which Jehovah overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Fire, brimstone, and salt. They do go together because they're all um, uh, related to the payment for sin, which has to do with sacrifice for sin. And just one more verse. If we go to the New Testament, Mark chapter 9. Mark 9. Um, it says in Mark 9... <clears throat> and, and I won't uh, read the whole passage. It, it, it's repetitive because God's driving home a point. But it says in verse 46, uh, Where their worm dieth not, <clears throat> and the fire is not quenched, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, 
where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, for every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. The salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. But here, of course, where God is speaking of the eternal fire, which has often been misunderstood to burn forevermore in a place called hell. No, it just means that final fiery destruction that will destroy this world, this whole creation, and unsaved mankind along with it will be an eternal destruction of the corrupt creation and corrupt man. And, and so uh, it, it, the fire is not quenched in that sense, uh, because the effects of that go on for all eternity. Man is forever destroyed. But in this passage that has everything to do with the final judgment, God ties the fire with salt. Everyone shall, and, and every person, every person, for every one shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. And that, that does confirm that when God destroys the wicked on the last day or, or throughout this prolonged judgment period and then finally completely, utterly annihilates them on that last day, that they will be as though a sacrifice that has been salted. Every sacrifice is salted, and 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 so uh, their eternal death uh, will will be um, uh, it will stand as a memorial of salt in that sense as Lot's wife has to their their utter ruin forevermore, and 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 so that's that's the whole idea. God is. Um, basically indicating by turning Lot's wife into a pillar of salt, she was a sacrifice. Her own sacrifice for her own sins and, and therefore salt is in view. Well, we actually see further confirmation that this whole destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities of the plain that the, the entire burning, the falling fire and brimstone that, that did burn these cities and all the, uh, the inhabitants, that the whole thing is like a sacrifice. Now, where is that further confirmation? Well, it, it's found when we continue reading in verse 27. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before Jehovah. Now that um, is a reference back to chapter 18 when he stood before Jehovah interceding on the the part of the righteous in the city of Sodom and, and uh, uh, when, when he was saying will you destroy the righteous with the wicked and so he's returned to that spot and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo the smoke of of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. See, Abraham is at a distant location, yet it was such a grievous, um, terrible destruction. It, 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 was, it was just so devastating for these four cities and for all the land of the plain. Although Zoar survived, yet, yet for for all that area, and, and again we can understand it as the whole world, the whole world, and and Lot's still alive, Lot's daughters are still alive, Lot's wife has just been turned into a pillar of salt, but as Abraham has this vantage point, and we can really understand it since it's the place of his intercession. That it's as though God in heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ are watching what is transpiring on the earth 
as the cities of the plain are picturing the whole world that has been set on fire in the day of judgment, and they're looking down upon the earth, and, and what's left of the earth, uh, all they can see is the smoke of a furnace ascending up. But of course, as they're looking upon the area of the plain, and the destroyed cities, and the smoke ascending up, there are righteous still in that location, aren't there? Where's Lot at this point? He's in the city Zoar, which is in the plain. It's another city of the plain. And when we, we continue on, we'll find that he fears to dwell in Zoar because of the thick smoke, because of the, the, the terrible heat, probably, and, and, and just the ruin of all the cities surrounding that little city. And, and that is telling us that God is watching. That the Lord Jesus Christ is looking to the inhabitants of the earth. And the, the unsaved of the world, uh, even though it's a spiritual judgment in our time, in our day, they're, they're all dead. They're as good as dead. Once God shut the door of heaven, the only living upon the earth are the elect. And they are indeed upon the earth. Just as Lot is in Zoar. It, 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 Abraham probably couldn't even see Zoar. The, the smoke was so intense. And he couldn't see, certainly, Lot. And, and that's where this little um, the, uh, historical parable would fail because God sees all and God can certainly see all of his people that are that are still on the earth at this time. He knows us. He knows us intimately. He knows everything about our struggle and uh, as we go day by day through this time period. But but there God is watching. No wonder. No wonder we read in Isaiah 24. In Isaiah chapter 24 in a chapter devoted um, to the destruction of the earth. Again and again, God speaks of the destruction of the earth in this chapter. And he says in Isaiah 24, um, verse 5, The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. You see, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, just like all the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam were burned. Few men left. Lot is left. The righteous are left in the place where the burning took place. And, and so, no wonder God says in verse 15, Wherefore, glorify ye Jehovah in the fires. Uh, even the name of Jehovah, God of Israel, in the isles of the sea or in the continents, as all the continents are like islands, glorify Jehovah in the earth, which has been lit on fire spiritually. And in order to, to uh, emphasize that truth, the Lord had Lot in the land of the plain, in Zoar, while this is all happening. And, and here Abraham is going to the place of his intercession, and he interceded on behalf of the righteous. So he has a great concern, and again, a type of Christ, a great concern for the righteous, for his nephew, for his family that are in this destruction, this fiery destruction, and, 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 and he, with, with um, concern and deep interest, he's looking down at Sodom. He looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld 
And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Now, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of the furnace. And the word smoke used in verse 28, and it's found here um, twice. And I have to look at my notes uh, because uh, I'm going to get into Strong's numbers. But the word smoke is 7008. 7008 in Strong's Concordance. It's only found four times in the Old Testament. Four times. Twice in this verse. But both words smoke are the same word. Once it's translated also as smoke in Psalm 119, verse 83. And a fourth time, it's translated as vapors in Psalm 148. Psalm 148. It, it, and, and this is a wonderful passage where God is calling upon everything to praise His name. And it says in Psalm 148, uh, verse 5, Let them praise the name of Jehovah. For he commandeth, and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which shall not pass. Praise Jehovah from the earth, ye dragons in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and vapors, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. The word vapors in verse 8 is the word smoke. And so it, 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 it's interesting. I, I don't know if I fully understand that. However, however, this word, and, and you know, there is another word, Hebrew word for smoke that, that, uh, uh, that would have to do with like the smoke of a chimney. And, and that would have more to do with fire when, when a whole city is burning. Um, but God doesn't use that word. He uses this word that's only found four times, but this word is from another word, which is Strong's number 6999. Now, the word used in Genesis 19, um, in, in verse 28, twice, um, I, I would pronounce as Qatar. Qatar. The, the word uh, used in, uh, or, or the, that it's derived from, 6999, is kitar. Now, I might, uh, I shouldn't even try to pronounce it. I might have them backwards. But, but you can hear how similar they are. It's different vowel pointing. And, and so they're basically the same word with different vowels. And, and the vowel pointing was added. You know, it's only the consonants that that are inspired. And, and so uh, this word, 6999, is a word that we find in Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus 1, and it's in verse 9. And actually, it's found four times. I'll, I'll begin reading in verse 9, and then we'll skip down. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto Jehovah. And it's found in verse 13. But he shall wash the inwards and the legs with water, and the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto Jehovah. Same thing in verse 15, And the priest shall bring it unto the altar, and wring off his head, and burn it on the altar, and the blood thereof shall be wrung out at the side of the altar. It's the word burn, the word burn, in all those verses. Now, um, this is the same word that's uh, also found in another place, and it's translated as burn incense. Burn incense. And we'll look at that when we get together in our next Bible study. But, uh, keep in mind that this word, 6999, is used over a hundred times in the Old Testament. And it always, from what I could find, in every case, has to do with sacrifice. Every single time. It, it, it's not a word you would use of, of burning logs on the fire. It's, it's a word 
related to the fire of sacrifice. 